good evening and welcome. Hope you had a great afternoon. Let's stand together tonight as we begin the song. We praise thee, O oh God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, find the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, find the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O oh God, for thy spirit. Amen. Welcome back to Bible Baptist Church. What a blessed day that we had with the Mike Speck Trio and our choir and orchestra. It was a blessing. The biggest Sunday we've had since uh, we reopened. Uh, 466 was the final number. So give the Lord praise for that. And uh, lest you panic, that was with two services spread out and the children's building full over there too. So we we took good care of everybody, but it was a blessing and many, many visitors in the late service for us to follow up and new families, and it's so just good to rejoice in those songs of praise and uh, just to have the choir back at full strength. It was just a blessing, and we're glad you're back with us this evening. Just came out of a deacons and trustees meeting, so I'm ready to preach. Amen? Amen. And uh, we have a great group of men that help lead and serve the, the congregation and and uh, I'm grateful for all of them and their families. We want to welcome you tonight, and good to have our friends from Ohio and Florida here uh, with us, the Barnetts and the Grimsleys, and uh, there are no strangers here. They're kind of like, I guess if we could do associate members, we could kind of uh, add them into the church family because they try to come as much as they can. And welcome to all who are watching online, Facebook, or YouTube channel uh, tonight. Well, our WANA program is starting in full force, and so our children, most of our children are over in the uh, children's building with the Awana. This is a Sunday night. Many years ago, my understanding is Awana used to be on Sunday night, and it, over the years it moved to Wednesdays, uh, but with COVID and every, all the uncertainties of things going on, we thought it'd be a good way to bring it back in uh, slowly and steadily here on Sunday evening, so we're going to give it a try for this first half of the, of the Awana year and see how it goes, but uh, parents, uh, we appreciate you bringing your little ones uh, to the Awana ministry. It's an important ministry, and uh, God really has used it to, to bless our kids and to teach them uh, His Word. And uh, so thanks to all the workers that are over there. And so good to have the choir back, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from them here in just a moment. But let's get started with prayer. Please remember the Browning family. Uh, Kevin's dad passed away, and I talked to him this morning. He was at church, uh, but uh, didn't have arrangements just yet. They're still working on those things. And then just before church started, I was told that Danette Horton's mother was taken to the hospital. We don't know uh, the need there, but uh, asked for prayer for Danette Horton's uh, mother. So let's get started with prayer. Brother Paul Long and uh, one of our associate pastors, he taught our combined Sunday school this morning. Well, I was going to say he taught it. He actually preached it. Amen. <laughs> He's been chomping at the bit for Sunday school to get started yes. for so long. And uh, so he did a great job today. Um, but you'll have more opportunities. So Hallelujah. You don't have to give it all to us at one time. Oh, I don't. You know? Okay. All I right. got plenty left. <laughs> Would you pray for us? Yes, sir. Please? Thank you. Let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the services this morning, Lord, as we try to get back into a routine, Father. And we realize it's going to be slow and we want to make sure we do things carefully and in order. And, Lord, we just want to glorify you. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being able to speak this morning. I pray for Pastor McInerney as he stands behind this pulpit tonight that you would give him the words to say. Lord, prepare our hearts to receive that message. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen.
you may be seated tonight.
Thank you, Brother Vincent. A song of revival, a prayer in that song of revival. Before we get to our main text, I want to ask you to look at Isaiah chapter 57. And uh, this has just been a wonderful day of praise and worship to the Lord, the special music, just what we needed uh, today in the choir. The clinic they had yesterday was a powerhouse of time, and I really appreciate I. I don't uh, just say that. I really do appreciate the extra time that the choir members and the orchestra members put in. They were here a good part of the day yesterday, and uh, then again today, the two services getting here uh, by 7.30 and uh, rehearsing. It was just a a great testimony of their love for the Lord and for their ministry, so uh, thank you so much. But in Isaiah chapter 57, as uh, Brother Vincent was singing, we're just uh, a couple weeks now, three weeks away from our revival services. And so as uh, we begin preparing for those special meetings, I want uh, you to tune your hearts to uh, the Holy Spirit's voice as He's sharing with you and convicting you and preparing you for revival. And the Lord gave me this verse several months ago, and I thought this is a great verse to, to theme our revival, especially in the midst of a broken Uh, culture in which we're finding ourselves in. But notice Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I will dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And so that's the theme of our revival coming up here as we pray for America We pray for our nation, we pray for the churches, not just our church, but all of the churches, Bible preaching, believing churches, uh, that God would revive the spirit of the humble and of the contrite ones. And I'll be preaching more about that just before the revival, but that's our theme, and we need that prayer, Brother Vincent, to Lord touch your people once again. Amen? Uh, Wilt thou not revive us again, the psalmist said, that thy people will rejoice in thee. Well, tonight, find your Bibles, the book of Acts, the book of Acts 26, please, Acts 26, and stand with me when you found your place there. We've had a wonderful, wonderful week of reports. I know last Saturday, a week ago, uh, the evangelism team had three or four people saved. Then last Sunday morning in the 8 o'clock service, the college-age young lady walked the aisle to trust Christ as her Savior. And then Sunday night after service, we'd been dismissed and folks were gone, but another couple came and and we talked some things over here at the altar and they prayed to receive Christ. It's just been a blessed week and uh, God is good, amen? And then with the great attendance today and many, many visitors, uh, he just keeps sending folks uh, our way. Pastor Hubbard said we may have to have three services or go to Saturday night services. I said, well, I'm too old to do three services I did it before, but I don't. that was when I was 35, and I'm too much of a former Catholic to have Saturday night church, amen? So uh, that ain't happening. That ain't happening. We'll, we'll just spread folks out if we have to, but uh, we're not going to turn anybody away, that's for sure, amen? Uh, we'll just keep doing what we got to do uh, to, to uh, accommodate the folks and keep everyone as safe as possible. But Acts chapter 26 I want to follow up a little bit from last, we're not really having a missions conference this year, but we've, we've already added two missionaries and we're going to be talking about missions and we have our world missions offering coming up uh, here at the end of the month. And so I've been trying to plug in some messages here and there about evangelism and soul winning and the mission work because mission work is not just over the sea, amen? It's not just across the ocean, uh, it is truly across the street amen. and around the world, it, it's both. And uh, Jesus told us to do it both, simultaneously. You shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. And so all at the same time, the gospel is to be preached and we are to be who we are supposed to be as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So last Sunday I talked about how's the fishing, about being fishers of men. And how they straightway left their nets and followed Jesus. And tonight I want to to see Paul's testimony. Paul, the great persecutor who becomes the great presenter of the gospel. But I want you to see his testimony in Acts chapter 26 beginning down in verse 12. I'm going to read several verses but just follow along. He said, Whereunto 
uh, or whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. And think about that little phrase right there. For this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now notice he continues, verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, and please be seated. The testimony... The first person account of the Apostle Paul before the king, sharing his mission, sharing his purpose. And he uses that phrase that Jesus said, for this purpose. This is the reason, Paul, that I called you. This is the reason that I've ordained you a prophet. This is the reason that I have put you to work is for this purpose, for this purpose, and he's standing before King Agrippa, giving uh, his testimony. It's not the first time he's done it. Uh, he's already spoken before Felix and, and Festus. And uh, he's talking about bringing light, uh, turning people from darkness to light in verse number 18. We'll break that down in a moment. And would you agree with me today that our world is in great darkness? It is in great We claim to be the most enlightened generation, but yet we're living in the worst darkness. The darkness of sin, it's morally dark in America. We have come to the place, we were discussing this with our friends, we've come to the place where, where, where the Bible says there's going to coming a day where they're going to call evil good and good evil. Well, we're here now. It's not coming, it's here. Amen? Uh, when you have police officers ambushed in their car, that's bad enough. And then you have protesters at the emergency room saying we hope they die while they're in surgery. Uh, we have come to a bad place, a morally dark place in America. Uh, educationally, our world is dark. I listened to the superintendent of the Los Angeles County Schools, the largest school district in America telling all of her faculty, we don't anticipate returning to the classroom until after the election. Well, what does the election have to do with COVID? Does COVID know the calendar? And it knows to be over as soon as the election is announced? Don't get me started. We're in a dark place educationally. Educationally. We're in a dark place politically. I've shared this before, but someone told me years ago, if all of our politicians, think of them, all of them you can think of, if they were all on a sinking ship in the middle of the ocean, who would be saved? And the answer is the American people. Amen? <laughs> so you've got to think that through. We're in a religiously darkened world. We are in a spiritually darkened world. The Bible talks about the greater the darkness, the greater the need for light. The remedy for darkness is light. Light always wins. In the darkest caverns, in the darkest caves, one match sends darkness 
fleeing. We had some friends, a church in Ohio where my wife uh, was saved, and they were into caving, uh, called spelunking. You ever heard of that? It's a real word, spelunking. Um, They invited me to go. Frank Cecil and Randy Goodman, a couple other people, invited me to go. Well, back then, I could have spelunked. Because there are places where you had to squeeze yourself through. I can't spelunk today. The caves have gotten smaller. The passageways have have narrowed. And uh, I cannot do that. And I wouldn't do that. And when I would crawl, they crawl through the mud and, and with the rocks pushing on their back, trying to squeeze under things in the dark. And they're crawling when thing, other things are crawling. Not for me. And they get, thank you. And they get down there and they turn on the light or the lantern or the match or the candle or whatever. Guess what? The darkest places on earth, darkness has to flee when light enters. Light always wins. And Jesus said, we are the light of the world. And he declared himself to be the light of the world. And so Jesus instructs the Apostle Paul here in a very similar uh, format, a very similar wording to the Great Commission itself. Uh, Notice in verse 16 again, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. And so he's basically giving Paul the Great Commission personally. One-on-one. He gives it to the church in the book of Matthew. Now he's giving it to Paul personally, one-on-one, the Great Commission. And he says uh, uh, that, Paul, this is the purpose. As a child of the light, as a child of God, that you are sent to deliver the people, as you're sent to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God. And child of God, I just want to remind you, we are to be a different people a peculiar people. We are to be light in darkness. Listen, as a child of God, don't be guilty of adding to the darkness, but rather be involved in causing the darkness to flee. Don't add to the darkness. Chase the darkness. No man lights a candle, Jesus said, and hides it under a bushel, right? All that's doing is increasing the darkness. But you set it on a candlestick so that may provide light to those around. We are to stand out in a crowd. We are to be a peculiar people. The world should see our faith and our peace that we have and our joy that comes, as I talked about, a life of praise, a life of worship. The world should see that and know that it comes from Christ. We, as God's people, understand the need of soul winning, the need of missions, the need of new churches. Why do we send missionaries? Why do we support missionaries? Why do we receive missionary offerings? Why do we send people on missions trips? Because we are aware of the need for the light to be taken into dark places. And our mission is the same as Paul's, to turn them from darkness to light in verse 18. Notice that. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, Jesus said. So I want to share with you the importance of the purpose. What happens, and I said it last week, I'll say it again, we don't make a big enough deal about someone being saved. We really don't. It it ought to be a a hallelujah, Baptocostal fit when someone comes to know Christ as their Savior or gets that settled. It ought to be a rejoicing in the church, a rejoicing in the family of God. Because here's what happens. Let me break it down for you according to this verse. Let's see what happens when someone goes from darkness to light. What dramatic changes take place. It is a big deal. 
The first thing it says is their eyes are opened. Their eyes are opened. Now you stop and think about that. This world is moving around blindly. They really are. They ever learning, the Bible says, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're stumbling around in this darkness. They're blinded to it. They don't know a direction. We sing the song, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's not just a metaphor. That's a true testimony. The Bible says that Satan has blinded the eyes, blinded the minds of them, lest they should believe. Their eyes are opened, and when someone gets saved, a life that was purposeless now has purpose. You realize you're not one of just seven billion people on a planet, but you're a child of God who has a plan for you, who has a future for you, who wants a relationship and fellowship with you. You're not just, again, a, a dot, a speck of dust in the universe. You're now indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. A life finds purpose. Hopelessness turns to hope. And a failure finds a future in Jesus Christ. So many are groping in darkness today. And they're looking, as Paul mentioned in his lesson, they're looking in all the wrong places for the answers. They, they look to alcohol to open their eyes. It doesn't work. I have never in my 51 years seen alcohol enhance someone's decision making. Doesn't work that way. So they look to drugs. They look to a new relationship. They look to a an addictive behavior, groping in that darkness, trying to find something to answer the need of their heart and the need of their soul. The Bible says when someone's turned to Christ, their eyes are opened. Secondly, it says they're delivered from the power of Satan. Notice that verse, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God. Well, we could park right here. We could park right here for a while. That's a big deal. Do you understand that, friend? And this is a great attendance tonight. Thank you. I don't know if you all just need a break from your kids while they're in Awana. Or if you're really excited about church. But I'll take it either way. Don't tell me if it's Awana, okay? Don't tell me that because that will make me feel bad. This is a big deal. Do you know what it means to be delivered from the power of Satan to the power of God? Wow. Now, if you were saved as a child like me, you didn't have a long list, perhaps, of wickedness and evil. and You didn't have a list of all these things that some people saved later in life do. But think about it. The Bible says that unsaved people are under the power of Satan. Now, they don't like that, and if you don't say it right, they'll, they'll say, you're calling me a devil worshiper? No, we're not calling you a devil worshiper. We're just saying that what Jesus said, that until you come to the light, until you're saved, you're under the influence of Satan. Jesus said it this way, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust and the will of your father, that will you also do. And when you're not saved, you have no power to change that. You can't do it by yourself because the devil is stronger than you. And without Christ, you're nothing to him. And he can whip you around any way he wants. He can direct you. You're a puppet on his string. And on your own, there's nothing you can do about it. But when you cross from the power of Satan to the power of God, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the strings are broken, the chains fall off, the bondage is gone, 
and you're no longer controlled by every whim of the devil. That's a big deal. That'll preach in every church in America that's open. They're delivered. I like that word. From the power. Turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. They're delivered from the power of Satan to the power of God. Now that they're saved, they have power for victory in their life. Oh, victory in Jesus. They have power over sin. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you were not saved, you didn't have power to resist. Oh, certainly you had some conscience. Certainly you had some will, some self-will, and you could, you could maybe say no to some things. But you couldn't break those bonds completely without the power of God, without the Holy Spirit. And so this sin might not have tripped you up, but he had something else in his bag that would trip you up. And this problem might not be yours, but he has a whole bag, a whole tool chest of things that he used against you. And once you're saved, you're delivered from that power. And the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Before you were saved, you try to resist the devil and he laughed at you. He would say, who do you think you are? You're one of mine. But when you're saved, he says, who do you think you are? I'm a child of the king. I'm a blood-washed, born-again child of the king. And I resist you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. And greater is he. Man, I'm going to preach in a minute. Just about a minute. Power for victory, power over sin. One day, because we're saved, we'll have power over the grave. Ain't no grave going to hold my body down. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm getting up out of the ground. Because there ain't no grave going to hold my body down. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us, O grave, where is thy victory, O death? Where is thy sting? Someone is saved, they're given power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. You see, what a change that takes place when the power of God rules the lives of men. The testimonies of the redeemed, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I used that verse this morning, changed our life, changed our destiny, changed our eternity, changed our home. Evangelist Tommy Stone, I talk about him a lot. You know his name by heart. You'll know all his stories before it's over. But I love the song. I can't sing it. There's a high part in it, and I can't get to I may have to lower it. I may have to see if Dudley can sing it. Dudley, if you're watching, Dudley, if you're watching, you better be practicing. Amen. He says this. It talks about the old man. The man you see before you may look a lot the same. I may wear the same old clothes, still have the same old name. But if you're looking on the outside, if you could see inside instead, you'd see a brand new man, for the old man is dead. I've been delivered from the power of Satan. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. It's a big deal when somebody gets saved. They're turned. Their eyes are opened. They're turned from the power of Satan to the power of God. Number three, let's keep going. Verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. <laughs> wow. Whoo, this is good stuff. That they may receive forgiveness. What a wonderful word that is. Hey, have you ever needed forgiveness? Mm hmm. Some of you are looking at your watch. I forgive you. <laughs> Some of you are turning off Facebook. I forgive you. Don't touch that dial. Have you ever needed it? Oh, I've needed it. Every day I need it. 
It's a wonderful word. We need to receive it, and we need to extend it. Forgiveness, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Notice Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, if we have that, please. Ephesians 1, verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Verse 7. Verse 7. It's already in there. Excuse me. The riches of His grace. Notice that. The forgiveness of sins. Not just overlooking our sins. See the difference in this word. Not just winking at our sins. But the forgiveness of sins. Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Some of you know these old songs. Jody's the one that got me started. Every song we sung tonight was an old song. He got me worked up. No matter the record, no matter the offense, no matter the history, they're forgiven. Our choir made a CD in Ohio. A song says, My sins have been nailed to the cross of my Savior, where Satan has no power, for God has displayed His undeserved favor. He has taken my sin, and He has nailed it to the cross. Whoo, that'll preach. My sins have been nailed to the cross of my Savior, where Satan has no power, for God has displayed His undeserved favor. He has taken my sin. And nailed it to the cross. This definition of forgiveness in this text, in Strong's Concordance, says this. Freedom and pardon. Freedom and pardon. It's gone. It's gone. Webster's Dictionary says it this way. The definition of forgiveness in Webster's Dictionary. Listen close, church. To cease to feel resentment against. To cease to feel... When God forgave me, He ceased to, re, to feel resentment toward me. What was causing the resentment between me and a holy God? Sin. Your sins, your iniquity, Isaiah said, has separated between you and your God that He will not hear. And the buffer, the resentment, as God looked at my sin, a holy God looking upon my sin. But when Jesus forgave me of my sin, paid the price, nailed it to the cross, the sin was removed, and now when God sees me, He no longer feels resentment toward me because He's forgiven me. They receive the forgiveness of sins. Why do we need to be involved in sharing this message with people? Why do we need to be inviting people to church and praying with them? Why do we need to be sharing the gospel? And, and I was so glad I mentioned our gospel tracks last week, and after the evening service, a bunch of them were gone, and uh, we had to restock the shelves. Amen. Take as many as you want. We'll print more. Amen? Amen? We'll print more. Why do we need to do that? Because look at the change in somebody's life. Their eyes are open. They're, they're, they're taken off of the, the puppet strings of the devil. They receive forgiveness of sins. No matter the record, no matter the offense, they're forgiven. They stand redeemed in the blood of the Lamb. And then notice in this verse 18 that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now remember, Jesus is talking, so the me is him. Now don't let me confuse you with pronouns. He said that is in me. They are sanctified by faith that is in me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They receive an inheritance. 
Now the Bible says we who are saved are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, notice verse 3, 1 Peter 1 and verse 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, Reserved in heaven for you. When someone is saved, as they become a part of the family of God, there is an inheritance, reserved, uncorrupted. It's not fading away. What does that mean? You know how they say a dollar doesn't buy what today, what it did years ago? Listen, your inheritance hasn't changed. It hasn't faded away. Your heavenly inheritance is not subject to inflation. It's not subject to the economy. It's not subject to COVID. The inheritance that God preserved for you is there. And it will be there through eternity. It fades not away. It's reserved in heaven for you. Not only do we inherit the blessings of God. Think about this. When somebody gets saved, they, they inherit the blessings of God as part of his family now. They become a child of God now. They receive the power of God now. You with me? Their eyes are opened now. They get the blessings of God now. But if that wasn't enough, heaven's still to come. Heaven is still to come. I sang this song at somebody's funeral. I don't know who. It says, I once heard a story about a sainted old mother who lived out her life here on earth. As she lay on her deathbed, her friends gathered round her. And these are the words that they heard. Oh, look what I'm trading for a mansion. Oh, look what I'm leaving behind. Oh, look who will be there to greet me when I enter God's sweet paradise. I'll be leaving behind all my sorrow. I'll be leaving behind all my care. For I've traded it all for a mansion that Jesus has gone to prepare. Oh, look what I'm trading. Look what I'm trading. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands, the song says. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords to me. They receive an inheritance. My friend, Not only is their life changed now, but their life is changed for eternity. Their life is changed forever. Go back with me to Acts 26, verse 18. Now, this is Jesus talking. If your Bible has red letters, that's what it means. It's not a a printing error. It's a recognition of Christ's words directly. And so this is Christ talking to the Apostle Paul. Paul is quoting Jesus personally. He said, To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. For this purpose, for this purpose, What greater purpose do we have than this purpose? What greater purpose do we have than sharing the gospel? Dr. Howard Sears, one of my mentors, he uh, was in his 90s when he died. He preached for years and years and years. Pastor Hubbard may remember Howard Sears. Grace Baptist Church, Middletown, Ohio. 
preached there about 35 years, but just a tremendous man of God. He was known for his, for his mind. He had a sharp mind. He memorized hundreds and hundreds of poems and songs and could call them off even up until his 90 years old. On his 90th birthday, somewhere around his 90th birthday, he lived about 35 miles from the church. We rented a limousine and went and picked him up because you don't want him driving. He's 90 years old. And we had him speak at an evening service, and we picked him up in a limousine and brought him to the church and uh, came in and he preached for us that night. And we made a big deal about Dr. Sears. But he was known for this saying, one of many. He said, I'm just an old beggar telling other beggars where I found the bread of life. I'm just an old beggar telling other beggars where I found the bread of life. For this purpose. What greater purpose? Friend, if I could give you $10 million now and I couldn't, Pastor Hubbard could, I could not. If I could give you $10 million right now, it would not be as good as if I introduced you to Jesus Christ. If I could cure your cancer or your heart disease, it would not do you as much good. If I could give you a kidney, it would not do you as much good as turning you from darkness to light. For this purpose, church, every one of us are here for this purpose. Every one of us, from the youngest to the eldest, from the longest saved to the newest saved, this is the purpose. As we consider missions, evangelism, soul winning, what greater thing could we do for any man or woman or boy or girl than to bring them the good news about Jesus Christ? The light of the world is Jesus. So if you're saved, don't forget what your purpose is. For our church, we must never forget what our purpose is is. For the preaching, we must never forget what the purpose is. If you're saved, are you fulfilling that purpose? Are you doing all you can do? And without repeating last Sunday night's message, we need to prepare ourselves to share the gospel. We need to pray for opportunities to share the gospel. We need to be bold in our witness of sharing the gospel. We need to give so that ministries can go forward and missionaries can go out and churches can be started for this purpose. This purpose. Jesus' purpose was not just to teach. His purpose was to save. Jesus' purpose was not just to build followers. His purpose was to save. I have come to seek, say it with me, and to save that which was lost. That's His purpose. A lot of churches, a lot of businesses, this was very popular in the 90s, a mission statement. If you had a business, you had to have a mission statement. If you had a business or a Office, you had to have a purpose statement. It was so popular, it just it kind of ran its course. I mean, I even saw police departments with a mission statement. The mission statement is, keep us safe. The purpose is, bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do? I mean, the grocery store had a purpose statement. Everybody had a purpose. School had a purpose statement. City council had a purpose statement. 
Y'all, you all remember what I'm talking about? Usually it's in their lobby, it's in their, in their manuals, it's in their, this is our mission statement, this is our purpose statement. Well, here's our purpose. For this cause, Jesus said. For this cause, this is the purpose. We don't need it on a poster. We don't need it in our manual. We, we don't need it on, on a sign. We need it right here. For this purpose, to open the eyes of the blind, to deliver them from the power of Satan and to the power of God, to provide an inheritance that fades not away in heaven. Wow. You got your purpose? Let's be busy about it. Let's pray for souls. I was so excited about the people who got saved last week and those on the evangelism team. And I know COVID has thrown everything off. And, but I want to tell you something. There was a day in my ministry, and I'm sure there were days in this church's ministries, where people were walking these aisles every week. People were being baptized every week. I know it's so because I found an old bulletin from nearly 40 years ago that had listed baptisms in the hundreds in that year. And I know societies change and cultures change, and I know it's hard to get people, but if we all have the same purpose, the need is the same. Amen? Amen. And so it ought not surprise us when people walk the aisle to be saved. It ought to surprise us when they don't. And so let's be purposeful about our purpose. And let's be strong in our mission. Amen? Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Our heads are bowed and eyes closed. Tonight, you may be here and not have 100% assurance that you're saved. There may be some question in your mind about this inheritance, this eternity, this time that you'll be standing before God. And if there's anyone like that tonight or watching us online, you have some question mark about salvation, you don't have it nailed down, tonight I want to encourage you. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know. God doesn't want you to wonder, doesn't want you to worry, doesn't want you to waste your life fearful, you can know that you're saved and have it settled. And whether you're in this auditorium or you're watching again online, by calling upon the name of the Lord, by accepting His free gift of salvation, by trusting in what Jesus did for you, the forgiveness of sins, calling upon His name. Tonight, if you're not saved, I invite you to pray with me, dear Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that you have forgiven me for my sins and that you rose from the grave. And I ask you tonight, I call upon you to be my Savior and my Lord. Sincerely as I know how, I repent of my sins and ask you to save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, Christian, there may be some other prayer request, some other need. Again, as last Sunday night, somebody on your heart that's not saved, somebody that you would pray and ask the Lord to give you an opening opportunity to, to talk to them or one more time to cast the net, one more time invite them to church, one more time give them a gospel track. Whatever the need might be tonight in this closing invitation song, 
We invite you to come, pray at your seat, pray here at the altar. But let's stand together as Brother Jody leads us, just, just as I am. As I am with the altar's open for you. If you've been saved and need to be baptized, maybe you need to join the church. Maybe there's somebody on your heart that you want to pray for. We invite you to come. Just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Let's bow our heads in prayer just for a moment on this last verse. Brother Jody, you lead us, please. You're welcome to come. God's people said amen, amen. Thank you. Please be seated just for a moment. I want to share with you just a couple quick uh, announcements. I didn't want to make you stand up all that time. So very quickly before uh, we leave tonight, and we'll ask the uh, blessing on the offering, and our ushers will be prepared in the back to receive that uh, from you tonight. But uh, let me mention about our cleaning teams uh, that we have through the week. And uh, we have some extra work now because of COVID. We have bought a, a fogging machine, uh, D, uh, I forget what it's called, sanitizer thing, electrode something. It's, 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 it's like a backpack, like Ghostbusters, okay? And you go th- we have to go through and, and sanitize all these buildings. But uh, because of school starting back and some folks had moved away and different things, we have been short on our cleaning teams. And I just want to tell you, this ministry saves the church literally, literally, thousands of dollars a year in janitorial costs, Um, and we appreciate everything that you do. But if you have uh, two to four hours twice a month uh, is about what it takes, so about, what is that, uh, four to eight hours a month, Uh, if you would like to help with one of the cleaning teams, you can contact uh, any of the staff pastors and let them know when you're available. Uh, We normally do it on Mondays because of Sunday and then on Thursdays because of Wednesday, but I appreciate all who are helping. But we've got some folks that cannot continue, and we want to get some more folks helping us. So let any of the pastors know, or myself, and, and we can plug you in somewhere uh, where, where, when you're available. Um, also, um, this Wednesday night, our CLU classes continue. Uh, they're off to a, a fairly good start. And uh, we also have the Kids Club going on for kids four years through fifth grade. Choir practice is now back in session on Wednesdays. And our Bible classes are back here on Wednesday nights in Victory Hall. And even if you didn't sign up for one, don't worry about it. We can plug you in uh, to some of those classes on on Wednesdays. Um, Next Sunday, we have a special guest, David Gibbs III, National Center for Life and Liberty. Be with us in all the services, 8 o'clock, 1030, and the evening service at 5 o'clock. And he's going to be speaking um, about constitutional liberties and history and the Christian church in America and, and some of the uh, concerning things that we're seeing from churches being fined in California to being regulated in other states. And uh, we're seeing some, some anti-Christian behavior, certainly, uh, in our country. And so he's going to talk on some of those things, um, and you will enjoy uh, his ministry next, next Sunday. Uh, he'll be here all, all day long. And uh, then, again, two weeks from now is the Hope Missions off, Hope Children's Home World Missions offering. Special envelope in your bulletin to use for that. This is an above and beyond offering is the best way I know how to explain it. Um, so we receive our regular offering that day, and then whatever's designated specifically for missions uh, will be shared uh, with the Hope Children's Home and our World Missions Fund. Um, so pray about that in the couple, next couple of weeks and think about what the Lord would have your family do above and beyond your normal tithes and offerings. And then our revival. We've prepared some flyers out front. 
revival is going to go on like a normal except for these changes. Uh, we like to, we've moved it back now. It was supposed to be in September. We pushed it back to October. Um, but we're not going to do the meals uh, before service, the fellowship meals. We're not quite ready. That's part of phase four, and we're in phase three right now. So we're not going to do the fellowship meals before revival, but Sunday will be the normal schedule, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be 6.30 p.m. And we're going to have choir and special music each night. There will be nursery and toddler care. There will not be a wana the night of revival. Okay, parents? So we want the church family, we want the kids, we want everybody to be here uh, in the service for revival. So there will not be a wana on October the 4th. And pray for Pastor Hudson and for his messages and for uh, the church as we uh, really, it's a good time with the. Uh, Elections coming and all the stuff that's going on. We really need to pray for our country, uh, for revival, and for God's uh, Spirit to, to be upon our people. So lots going on. Get a copy of the bulletin. And uh, in case you were in the early service, you may have missed, but uh, we're glad to have the Miller family join the church today. Uh, Sean and Meredith Miller and their three children. I know a couple of them are here tonight, and we're glad to have them as part of the BBC family. When we the two services, you kind of miss things from service to service, and so we want to share that with you. I'll also be uh, sharing some updates in the pastor's page this week. So let's pray for the offering, and you give to the Lord as He's blessed and prospered you. Brother Aaron Hulls, would you come up here for a second? And um, when you sit in the front, you get picked on, right, Eston? You're next. You, okay. <laughs> but would you pray for the offering as we're dismissed tonight? God bless you. Uh, for Wanda parents, you can hang out for a while. They're not going to be done until about 6.30, okay? So uh, don't leave them. Wait on them. Wait on them. All right. Thank you. Dear Lord, we uh, just thank you for another day in your house. Uh, we thank you for that message we just heard. Uh, we ask you for strength and power to be bold and deliver the message like like Pastor just illustrated, uh, we ask your blessing over this uh, offering today and just uh, that we, you keep meeting the needs of this church like you always do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.